glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. All right, all right, all right. Bonnie, Bonnie, give it up. Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, it's it's really, um, it's a double-edged sword on, on the last day because um, I know that we're both sad and happy. We're happy because we came um, and we, we've done the work and we've, taught and we've encouraged and we've um, encouraged you to stay strong and righteous and at the same time we're sad because we'll be leaving and heading home and we've made new friends here in the community I know David has shared with me how grateful he is that during this time when he has suffered tremendously um, of having his wife stripped out of his life for over 19 days and held in solitary confinement without justified reason, how he suffered. David is a man just with a heart so full of love, and he is so grateful to all of you for loving on him and hugging him and praying for him and I and for being such a blessing to us in our dark and our dark trying hour. So he's, he just, he would probably not share that with you, so I will. He's very grateful for everything that you've done to nurture and bless him while he's there. So I want to thank all of you for that, as well as the people that also um, are the, you know, some of the vendors who are, are good friends of ours that we have traveled with in the past. They are also nurturing David, and he's very grateful. I'm hoping that um, one of our vendors... Um, that lovely lady with the long dark hair can get up and take photos of everyone in the class so that we can put that on our um, Telegram channel and let everyone know what an amazing um, group we have for this Michigan event. And if she can just take about 10 or 12 photos of the whole class, that'd be awesome. Post it on our channel. Um, I would like to take time to pray with you. Are you guys up for that? Yes? Yep. Okay. <laughs> and before I do, I want to um, I want to encourage all of you to write this scripture down. I just found it this morning, and it's very interesting. Because there's nothing new under the sun, and the very things that we're dealing with now, our forefathers dealt with in Bible times as well. And we can read about it in Nehemiah 5 verse 1 through 13 where it talks about usury slavery uh, redemption selling our children into slavery through debt very interesting it just reminds me of all of the very elements that we are dealing with in this country now and the oppression that comes with those debts and being sold off into slavery and selling our children into slavery very interesting that God says in Joel 2.11, for strong is the one who executes his word. So we know that there's power in the word of God. And the Lord in Joel 2 verse 18 says, the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. In Joel 2.25, he also tells us that he will restore to us the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. So we will be restored in our nation, in our land. And you are part of that standard that God is raising up and using against the flood of the wicked that have come into our nation to plunder us. God is using you in this hour. And that was what we talked about briefly um, in the book of Isaiah 59, verse 19. So let us pray, shall we? If we will just bow our heads and petition our Father for a blessing this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We are so grateful for everything that you're doing. And what a blessing you are in our time of need, dear Lord. You hear our prayers. You see our suffering. You see the oppression. 
You see the debt slavery. You see how our children are whisked away into uh, wicked schools where evil things are being taught to our children. How there is mesmerism on our television and black magic witchcraft and voodoo, mind control. It's disturbing what's happening in our nation, dear Lord. How our water is poisoned, how our lands are poisoned, our skies are poisoned. But you, dear Lord, tell us in your word that you will contend with those who contend with us and you will destroy those who destroy the land. Dear Lord, I pray for a blessing and a shield of protection over everyone in this room, that you bless them in every every place that they go, every word they speak. Help them, dear Lord, to surrender wholly and completely their lives to you, that they would stand firm as a current of righteousness no matter where they go. Dear Lord, the average person has a sphere of influence of 250 people. But the people that are in this room are not average. They're above average. It helps their light to so shine before their fellow men that they would call other men and women to righteousness, to stand firm against this current of evil that is sweeping over our nation. I pray, dear Lord, for your shield, your blessing and protection over them at all times. I lift up David to you, dear Lord. And I pray for your blessing, your hand of protection on him, that you would station your holy angels around him, fill him with your Holy Spirit, that you would bless his feet and his legs, his back, his shoulders, his neck, and his mind and his mouth, that he would be a willing vessel speaking your words, um, offering your words of encouragement, words of strength, that he would be executing your word, dear Lord. I pray for... um, the answer, dear Lord, to come to his mind when you tell us that no weapon against us will prosper. We claim that promise over David and all the people in the room. When you tell us, dear Lord, that many are the afflictions of the righteous, that you will deliver us from them all, not just some of them, but dear Lord, you promise us that all of them, that you will relieve us from it all. I thank you in advance for that miracle and that promise. You are a mighty God and you are not a liar. You're only a truth teller. And when you you will do it, you will do it. And we thank you in advance for the miracles that you're working in Michigan. And dear Lord, I pray in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, God Almighty, the Son Jesus, also known as Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth, dear Lord, we surrender the land of Michigan to you. It is your land that your will would be done, that there would be nothing that would stop you, dear Lord. We grant you endorsement, permission, and we invite you into the land of Michigan to solve the problems that we need solved, that you would bless those who are afflicted and oppressed that you would free them from those who would take them captive and do them harm. I pray, dear Lord, that the wicked would be dealt with harshly by you or that they would repent and be saved. I pray also for the land of Texas, dear Lord. We surrender the land to you. We honor you, dear Lord. This land is yours to do with what you will. You would plunder our enemies and restore the righteous. Dear Lord, we thank you in advance, not only for these two nation states, but all of them. This whole continent, the North American continent, is surrendered to you, dear Lord. Please pour out your Holy Spirit in double portion. Fill it each and every soul with your Holy Spirit, like you tell us you will do. In the last days, dear Lord, that you will um, give the men dreams and women will prophesy and every soul will be filled with your spirit. We thank you in advance for the working and that you will return our children as you tell us you will do in Isaiah 49, 25 and 26. Dear Lord, you tell us you will contend with those who contend with us. We thank you in advance for the miracle working. Your will be done. And dear Lord, we pray we claim that promise in John 14, 13, that anything we ask in your name, it will be done. We bind all demonic activity that would attack us, harm us, and cast it out in Yeshua's name. We claim this prayer, dear Lord, to honor you and to glorify you and to magnify your word. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. In Yeshua's name, I, I pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you. We love you. God bless Michigan. God bless Texas. God bless America. God save us all. Have mercy on us, Lord. Stay free, everyone. We love you. I love you, David. I love you, too, honey. Talk to you later. I know you need one. I needed it too. I love you. Me too. Yesterday when I looked at uh, Bonnie's case on the docket last night, there's a Every day, I can see how they're changing little things, how they're moving little things, how they're adding little things. And so, every single day, it's a constant struggle to keep up with them. Every day we've got to rebut the things that they say. We've got to file notices of violations on them. One of the reasons why I've won most all the time with courts, with police and so on, is I set them up at the window for failure. I watch their failures and I put them on notice. I watch their failures and I put them on notice. And I watch their failures and I put them on notice. And I keep doing that and doing that and doing that. And pretty soon I got a stack of their violations. I don't worry so much about the facts of the case. I go after them in a totally different way than how any attorney handles your cases and how differently than most people handle their own cases. Most people take a case personally, see if I can get rid of that air noise, personally and when they do that it feels like that personal attack on them personally. And, and when you're emotionally involved like that, because you feel like they're attacking you, the man or the woman, that living person who has emotions and thought and, and a soul, 
it makes it harder for you to win. It's like going to war. A warrior can't take it personally. He does. He loses. He's the guy that got dragged off the field because his emotions don't let him think at the spear of the moment. He's thinking about his emotions. So the best way to win is first to know your enemy. Who are they? Who's coming after you? What's their Dun & Bradstreet number? What's their corporation? Where's its charter held? What subsidiary are they of what? I start right up there with Washington, D.C. With the White House Office, Inc. With the state of Texas. With the county of Johnson. With the county courthouse, 18th district of Johnson County. 18th District of Johnson County is a private for-profit corporation acting and pretending to be government under color of law. Acting and pretending. See, but how many people walk into a courtroom and call them out for the corporation that they are? Corporations, in order to deal with someone, has to have a contract there's got to be agreement. There can't be force, coercion, or anything like that. You have to have, they have to get your consent. So you got to find out, how am I giving them consent? How are they moving forward? Now, they do it two ways. Sometimes out of just pure evil and spite, and they change things to make them look good, and you look bad. And that's what they're doing to Bonnie right now. They're literally changing the public record on the docket. They've changed dates. They've added documents that we don't see, don't read, can't read online. So you don't know what they're doing. They hide things. They twist things. And if we can stand there and watch them doing that, and for them to do it, it's against, it's a violation of due process, it's a violation of human rights, okay? I got three documents sitting right over there that we've already written, written putting them on notice for those violations. But every day almost, they're doing another one. And it just gets to where you gotta check the computer three or four times a day. I've been on it at 9 o'clock at night. On it. I just pulled it up. Five minutes later, I hit refresh and it's changed. Last Saturday, last Saturday, they must have had a whole team in the courthouse because they were moving things changing things and some of it actually helped us they don't may not know that but it did 18 usc 1593 a 18 usc 1593 a this is their biggest crime that they commit Absolutely their biggest crime. I'm going to read it to you. People who benefited financially from peonage, slavery, and trafficking in persons. Now, President Trump wrote a nice executive order when he was in office just for people who do that, where they can have all of their assets forfeited. It's a beautiful thing. Whoever knowingly benefits financially or by receiving anything of value from participation in a venture 
which has engaged in any act in violation of section 1581A, 1592, or 1595A, knowingly or in reckless disregard of the fact that the venture has engaged in such violation shall be fined under this title or imprisoned in the same manner as the completed violation of any such action. See, 1581 through 1595 are all your RICO codes. And it's everything the courts, in combination with the police, remember what I did with the real estate people? It's the same way with all of them. You add all of them up together and it's a mafia group who is trafficking in persons. It's a RICO act. And I'm gonna challenge you all, one of the first things you guys ought to do, and it's gonna take a lot of pieces of paper, about 600 of them, so go buy two reams and download a PDF file called a Federal Prosecutor's Guide to RICO and print it off single page. Don't double side it. Don't cheapen yourself. It's worth that extra five, six bucks for a ream. The Federal Prosecutor's Guide to RICO. I then print it off and I take it down to Staples and I have them drill it so I don't have to sit there and punch holes every 10 pages. That take forever. And I put zip ties through it, nice big long ones, so I can walk in with it on my arm. I just stick my arm through all three zip ties. And it says Federal Prosecutor's Guide to RICO in big letters right on the front cover. And I walk into court with it. I want them to see it. So I put it right there. And then I'm going to set it down on the table. Just like that. That book teaches federal prosecutors how to prosecute RICO. You think it doesn't teach you how to prosecute RICO? <laughs> it's a beautiful book. I, I keep one in my office. 18 U.S.C. 1594, under general provisions, it says whoever attempts to violate sections 1581, 83, 84, 89, 90, 91 shall be punishable in the same manner as a completed violation of that charge. So, so you can go to each one of those and it'll tell you how many years in prison and how big the fine is. Okay? Whoever conspires with another to violate those sections shall be punished in the same manner as a completed violation of that section. Whoever conspires with another to violate section 1591 shall be fined under this title, imprisoned for any term of years or life or both. Understand how powerful and important that is. And this is where they all start. This is a, one of the things we accomplished a few years back that I thought was one of our, my big accomplishments, I like to include all of us as state nationals, was we went to the Department of Justice and we asked them to make a single page PDF file on their letterhead, putting the actual title at the bottom and then their summary at the top half the page. And so this one that we printed off, and you can print them off in color, they're making them harder to find on their website now. So you gotta actually type in 18 USC 242 PDF dot PDF, okay, in the search. <clears throat> so I'm gonna read the summary first. Summary. Section 242 of Title 18 makes it a crime for a person acting under color of any law. To will, what, what is color of law? 
It's a fallacy. It's a statute. See, any time a judge acts under statute, he is no longer a judge. He's a magistrate. And he removes his immunity. Now, they'll try and tell you they're immune. But gosh, I can tell you they're not. Because I've used it over and over and over again against them. And we can remove their immunity. See, they just lie to you. When they violate your constitution, they lose their immunity. When they violate due process of law, what is due process, you guys? The right of a jury of one's peers. The definition of peers is somebody from your own neighborhood who knows you, who knows your situation in life. Only then can your neighbors rightfully judge you. Because if they know you're a father with four little kids and a wife, and you've been off work for eight months, and you go into the grocery store and you are so destitute that you steal some food to go home and feed your family, that the greater crime is someone didn't help you in the first place, not the theft of the food. And that's usually insured anyway, see? The greater crime is someone didn't help you in the first place. And so a jury of one's peers, knowing your situation in life, would find you innocent or reduce it to a very minor crime that's easy to overcome. Maybe restoration of the food, put you on a community service program to cover the cost of food or something like that, rather than jail time which would destroy the family at that point. They'd lose their home, their electricity. They, they, I, it just tears the family apart. The children get taken from the state. All things that worsen the situation than what the crime. So the punishment for the crime becomes worse than the situation of the crime. And a true judge with a jury of one's peers would not let that happen. A true honest judge with a jury of one's peers would not let that happen. But what does the states always try and do? They try and find people outside your neighborhood, outside your community, people who don't know you at all. And they just quit, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> question them under Bordire to make sure they handpick their jury. See? For the purpose of Section 242, acts under color law include acts not only done by federal, state, or local officials within their lawful authority, but also acts done beyond the bounds of that official's lawful authority. Right there, it tells you they lost their immunity. If the acts are done while the official is purporting to or pretending to, isn't it the words they use interesting? Purporting to or pretending to act in the performance of his or her official duties. See, attorneys always practice law. Doctors always practice medicine. They practice, practice, practice. Nobody perfects law except us. The root of a lawyer is a law sayer who follows God's laws. That, well, that doesn't occur anymore. And that is different than an attorney. An attorney is an actor to a turn. They're the biggest criminals, the ones that say attorney the ones that say lawyers might be a better choice if you can train them. You know how I've trained them in the past? Because sometimes you just can't get them off of a case, okay? 
for somebody, but that person wants me to help. So I have to help without being able to say anything in the court, so I have to train their attorney. So I just start emailing them every day. Hey, read this. Hey, read this. Hey, read this. Precept upon precept, I teach them and show them the true law and change their darn mind. And then all of a sudden, I watch the lawyer who's been doing, uh, working on a case for a while and been doing things that he shouldn't be doing, I watch him start doing what's right. How many people do that? Nobody. This is why our people are destroyed. This is why our country's gotten so corrupt. We do not hold our public servants or those acting in our affair accountable. We don't spend our time with education. This whole world's about education. This is why I come to educate you, to help you. We got to do the same thing with our public servants. Every night, just before 10 o'clock, Bonnie calls me from jail. You know who she prays for? All her enemies. And names them by name. All the people in our county, her judges, there's three main judges in, in the county that she prays for. They're the worst of the worst that I've seen, some of them. One guy, I, threw, I believe he's good. But I believe he doesn't give a shit anymore. He's retired. He's very good, though. And he's a little bit compassionate, which is unusual in that judge world. Okay? One of them's a female judge. And for some reason, Bonnie really likes her. And she schools her. And she's only been a judge for two years. And I've never seen a judge in a courtroom so mean to somebody in the beginning as she was to Bonnie. But by the end of three and a half days, I watched her, Bonnie, in that courtroom for three and a half days. By the end, she ruled in Bonnie's favor. She looks at Bonnie. It's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the fourth day. And she looks at Bonnie and says, Bonnie, I need you to go ahead and write the order. I'll sign it that we need. And I need it back here by 4 o'clock. Can you do that? And Bonnie says, Your Honor, ye, Cindy, calls her by her first name. Cindy, you know, you know, I'd have to get out of here, get in the car, drive all the way across town to my office, write it up, print it out, go have it notarized, and get back here by 4 o'clock? I don't think I can do that. And the judge says, hold on a minute, Bonnie. She stands up off the bench, goes in the back room, into her chambers, and writes the document for Bonnie. And comes back in and signs it. Okay, that made me want to bang my head against the wall because I've never seen a judge write a document for somebody else. Okay. Did you know you're supposed to write the judge's orders with your remedy? Did you know that? And they'll sign it? You think they want to write it? Always have a judge's order with your documents when you send them in. If you ask for a motion for something, like to release somebody from jail, write the order of their release. That the, all the judge has to do is read it, say okay, and he's done. Write the orders with your motions. 
of what you want to have happen. Does it always work? No. Judges don't always sign it. This one didn't sign Bonnie's order for release that we wrote. He wants a hearing. So we had to wait for a hearing, which is coming up on Friday at 9 a.m. And anybody who wants to be in Johnson County, Texas, Friday at 9 a.m., I'd kind of like to swamp the town so bad we stop traffic. It'd be kind of fun. Fill the courtroom. Fill the room outside the courtroom, the waiting room. Fill the lobby. Fill the parking lot. And have cars parked so far away that we're, we've got every parking space filled. That's what I'd like to see. I don't know that it could happen. But I'll tell you what. If you want to see this movement grow, when Bonnie gets freed, it will grow faster than it has ever grown before. Because the whole damn world is watching Bonnie's arrest. The whole world. It could be one of the best things you could do to help this movement. It's 204 South Buffalo Avenue, Cleburne, Texas. It's the new Johnson County Courthouse. Okay? 204 South Buffalo Avenue, Cleburne, C-L-E-B-U-R-N-E, -E, Texas. Friday at 9 a.m., 5-5, May 5th. Okay. <clears throat> and that's very, very helpful, honey. Very helpful. Thank you. Well, let me tell you something. God's prayers work miracles when hundreds of thousands of people are praying. Yeah, and we're 200,000 or more gathered. It works too, or 2 million. <laughs> God's hammer comes down harder and harder and harder on the enemy the more people we put into the prayer. Okay? <clears throat> In Title 26, what did I say that was? The IRS Code. Title 26 of the United States Code is the IRS Code. In Title 26... Section 6671B and Title 26, Section 7343, the definition of a person is all of whom are officers or employees of federal corporations and not natural beings. Yep, I'll read it one more time because this is important. In 26 U.S.C. section 6671B and 26 U.S.C. section 7343, the definition of person is all of whom are officers or employees of federal corporations and not natural beings. Ah, I wonder why God in Job says, be the man and not the person. Don't put flattering titles of person upon a man. For if you do, I shall surely take you away. Now, I quote that different ways sometimes. Because sometimes I pull it from the 1611 King James, sometimes from the Geneva Bible, sometimes from the Greek Orthodox Bible, and so on and so forth. So all these people online sometimes say, oh, David misquoted the scripture. Well, what the hell are you reading, the NIV? That's so damn watered down, it's pathetic. They've changed the whole meaning of the Bible in that book. Don't read it. The older Bible you can find, the better off you are. In fact, the King of Kings, King James Version, was originally written for the king. Nobody else got one. And in it, they showed 
the changes. So it'll go along with a verse, and then all of a sudden there will be uh, two lines. One verse will become two lines with apostrophes, and one will be how it was supposed to be, and one line will show you how they changed it in the King James 1611 version. Plus, like I told you the other day, it has 400 years of history in between the Old Testament and the New Testament in that version, which are really, honestly, they're books that were left out of your, okay? But they found those books important enough that the king needed to know what it said. He needed to know what happened in that 400 years of history. If you guys are lucky enough in your entire lifetime to find one, sell your damn car or house to buy it. I'm telling you, to me, it's that important. I have one. It took me years to find. Years. And it's gold and it's gilded and it's just gorgeous. And it's full, full of art work that you won't get in any any other Bible. Okay. It's artwork, most of which is stored in the basement, in the tunnels, in the libraries, which are all big glass rooms that are temperature and humidity controlled to perfection under the Vatican. And they've got lots of art down there. And some of the artwork that's printed in there on, in paper in that King, that King of Kings version came from those paintings that nobody gets to see. So it's sad, really. So <clears throat> in 26 CFR, section 1.141, Four one dash one. You want me to start over? I was only like halfway through. Okay, I saw the look on your faces. Twenty six C F R section one point one four four one dash one. C, three, in parentheses, C, three, okay? The definition of an individual is defined as an alien or non-resident alien to the United States. Do you know what we are as state nationals? Non-resident aliens defined in the code. That's a state national. You're a non-resident of Washington, D.C., of the United States government. Therefore, you're alien to it of the state. And that's how the State Department looks at that. A lot of government forms three or four decades ago, used to have U.S. citizen, check the box, or non-resident alien, check the box. And so they had it on their forms what a state national was, is a non-resident alien. That's right, and they're starting to bring it back on various things. So, yeah, yeah. Things are starting to happen because of the, the size of this movement now. Um, one of our largest payroll uh, service companies in the United States that does payroll for about 100 million people is changing their forms because some of the top people in that company are now state nationals. Okay? And the more of us we get, easier things are going to get for all of us. I compare what we have available to us right now compared to 20 years ago. Ha! Huh. You do not know how hard it was back then. Compared to now, 
Now you got thousands of people who will help you just on the chats. You got all these documents being put on there. You know what I had to do? Create a lot of those documents by reading the manuals. You got it easy and you don't know it. That's all right. Somebody had to not go fishing. <laughs> Taxpayer. If you knew how much I loved to fish, I grew up on a river with salmon and steelhead and trout. And every day after school, you know where I was? <laughs> Down at the river. Okay. Salmon had come up so thick we could hit them with baseball bats and just pull them out. It's beautiful. Taxpayer, 26 U.S.C., section 7701A14, in parentheses. A14 is in parentheses. And 26 U.S.C., section 1313. The definition of a taxpayer. This is very interesting. This alone should make you stop paying income tax. Okay? And I haven't even got into that yet. The definition of a taxpayer is a person. That's an office holder on the vessel, right? Engaged in the trader business or franchise of government. And therefore, a public office holder within the U.S. government. Now, I don't know about you taxpayers out there, but how many of you are getting a 401k from the government and driving a government vehicle and getting a weekly check or a monthly check? <laughs> how many of you? <laughs> so are you that? I mean, government vehicles, they pay people about $120,000, $150,000 to drive those damn things around a year. Where's yours? That's ten grand a month. <laughs> what, honey? I can't hear you. Yes, of course I'll read it again. Because it's fun for me. Taxpayer 26 USC 7701A14 and 26 USC section 1313 is a, this is a person engaged in the trade, business, or franchise, and therefore a public office within the U.S. government. Government employees are the only ones required to pay income tax. by their own stinking code. But nobody bothers to look up the definitions in their code. So which teacher in junior high did not tell you that? <laughs> but they knew you were gonna be a taxpayer, right? See, here's the part that freaks me out about our public school system. How many people took algebra in high school? All of you. Now answer honestly. How many of you have used algebra since you left high school? That's, you guys are smarter than most. Very few, in fact, statistics show it's only 3% of the population ever, ever use algebra after high school. So if you're using it, it's because of your specific field you chose usually, right? Okay. Oh, it's to help your kids do their algebra. That doesn't count here. Keep that out of this conversation. Okay. <laughs> In 26 CFR, section 
one dash one C. You got that? Am I going too fast? Slow this morning, more coffee might be necessary. 26, see I got a good night's sleep last night for the first time in like a month. Seven full hours of peace. Seven hours of peace. So I feel pretty good this morning. And then Amy kind of fixed me up over in the hangar next door this morning too and that made me feel even better. You spend four or five or six times on that and see how much younger you feel. One time, that's kind of just like a demo. You really got to do it. Same with uh, Michelle and Bu Dr. Buzz's uh, equipment over there. That thing is, <laughs> I bought one. It's unbelievable. And they're not cheap to buy. And the training curve is like this, and I'm way down here. I don't even know how to use it very well yet. I, I can do the basics and that's about it, but it's incredible. And by the way, it's only been sold to practitioners up until we brought it to the market for you. I'm trying to bring things that will change your life. It's longevity. Dr. Buzz has revolutionized how long you can live, how young you feel, how lack of pain you could be in. He does a lot more than what you just see over there on that table. This is just the beginning. If you don't believe me, ask him about his exome therapy. Exome therapy, the National Football League has found it so important that they give every player, even the retired ones, any player who's ever played in the NFL, they give them $50,000 to start his exome therapy. That's how important it is. It'll make you younger. All right. So 26 CFR section 1.1-1C, the definition of a citizen in the IRS code and the CFR is defined as an artificial entity. You got to pay attention to this one because there's lots of little points in this sentence that you need to know. It is defined as an artificial entity with a domicile in the District of Columbia. And in 26 U.S.C. 7701-A9 and A10, it states the big caveat to this. And no part of any state of the union. Did you understand what I just read to you? I'm going to do it again. This is one of the most important discoveries I think I ever found reading law. When you, when you look at it. A resident is defined as an artificial entity that is an alien with a domicile in the District of Columbia and no part of any state of the union. The use of your zip code puts you in the District of Columbia and the use of even your street address at your home because it's the United States Postal Service. It is not a state of Michigan Postal Service. It is not a state of Texas. State of Tech. Hey, Rob, my volume went way down. Oh, we lost a speaker.
Can you hear me? No, it's it's lower. It's still lower in volume. <clears throat> that one's not working. Reset. Okay. Well, that's quieter anyway. All right. A9 and A10. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This one's kind of fun, too. Because all this goes together. Rest, um, taxpayer, citizen, resident, employee, U.S. person, on and on and on. They, so I'm, I'm, I'm working my way through. <clears throat> In 5 U.S.C., Section 2105, in 26 U.S.C., Section 3401C, and 26 C.F.R., Section 31.3401C-1. Want me to read that all again? You writing it down? Okay. Everybody got it? Okay. That's okay. 5 U.S.C. Section 2105, 26 U.S.C., there it is. Ah, you found, okay, connection. Good job, Rob. He is sure good at his job. Rob and Neil, give him a hand. American Meeting Group. Hey, Rob, how long ago was that Austin, Texas event? Summer of 2019. 2000, summer of 2019. That's how long Rob's been working with me. Okay. And he's from Michigan. Yes. Neil. All right. <clears throat> You know, it's hard to thank everybody that pitches in. It really is. Um, I love these guys. They're they're good. They're honest people. They they do their job impeccably. Rob's always buying new equipment, getting better, bigger, faster. <laughs> he spends. He's the, usually always the first one there and the last one to leave all weekend. In fact, most of the times when we have a, a building where you have to have a key to get in, we just hand Rob the key and he opens it up and he locks up. It's a big responsibility and he knows how to help save my voice, okay? Because when I get fired up, I'll lose my voice. I have one of those voices that doesn't carry like Bobby Lawrence. He could whisper up here and you'd hear in the back like it was bouncing off the walls. Mine goes about four feet and drops. And the people in the back wouldn't be able to hear it without Rob. Okay? Important to me. Where the hell was I? Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, 5 U.S.C. Section 2105, 26 U.S.C. Section 3401C, and 26 of the CFR, Section 31.3401C-1. An employee is defined as a U.S. person. Wasn't that cool? Wait a minute, I'm just getting started. And a U.S. person is defined in 26 U.S.C. section 7701A30, where the U.S., by the word the U.S., they mean is a government and not a geographical place.
That's really a big deal. Okay. Once you add these up right here, this tells you why to be a state national. You were born a state national. I was a state national from April 20th, 1963, when I came out of my mom's womb until May the 3rd, 1963. That was 13 days. I was a state national. The rest then, my mom check marked a box on my birth certificate application making my status change to a U.S. citizen. And for the first part of my life, all the way from 1963 to 1989, right at the end of December in 1989, is when I learned about being a state national. And I had no idea what the hell it was yet or what it could mean. But I knew enough that I wanted that. And I knew nothing. You guys just coming into this probably knew more than I knew then. I was just, just getting started. But the minute I heard about it, I went, okay, that sounds like freedom and liberty. Very, very important. We talked about the birth, we talked about the story of mother, you know why a birth certificate was created, okay? We all know that. One of the biggest ties we have with government is once we get married with a contract with the state. So I'm gonna read you a little story. I've read it at just about every seminar for 30 years. This date has not been changed, so it's outdated, okay? About 20 years ago, no, longer than that, okay? My former wife filed for divorce. We had seven children, five daughters and two sons. Our youngest at the time, our second son, was five years old. At the time, I prepared a counterclaim to the petition for dissolution her attorney had filed in the domestic relations court. I met one afternoon with the head of the Maricopa County Superior Court Marriage License Bureau in downtown Phoenix. The Marriage License Bureau was headed up by a young woman of about the age of 25. She was in charge. <clears throat> I know, it's kind of funny, isn't it? I asked her to explain to me the general and statutory implications of the marriage license. She was very cooperative and she called over an assistant. He was a tall black man, smart as a whip. I like that guy. And he was an attorney. And he was in the process, the reason he was in the office, he was in the process of writing a operations manual for internal departmental use. He, he's one of those guys that writes the policies they follow. <clears throat> she deferred for most technical explanations to her assistant, the attorney. He walked through the technicalities of a marriage license as it operates in Arizona. He mentioned that marriage licensing is pretty much the same in the other states, but there are just a few differences. One difference he mentioned was that Arizona is one of eight western states that are called community property states. 
hey, this is how I lost my first few million dollars in my life. <clears throat> no, I'll tell you. When I was 16 years old, my uncle and his wife were very famous. They owned a huge dance studio in Hollywood, California, and they never had any kids. But being my dad's brother, he kind of had, well, took a little liking to me. And his wife passed away about 10 years before he did. But they used to star in a lot of those old movies like Singing in the Rain and Top of the Town and all those, for the older people, they know what I'm talking about. The younger ones have a blank look on their face. But he taught a lot of very, very famous people how to dance. And he was a world champion at it. He was also, right after he got out of World War II, he decided he was going to get in better shape. He said he got fat in the army. So he started lifting weights. And within one year, he won a world champion weightlifting in his size category, which I thought was pretty interesting how quickly he beefed up. I'll chalk it up to good DNA. And I hope I have some. <laughs> but anyway, he had a lot of money. In fact, at the top of the hill in Glendale, California, he owned the house right on the very top. And he bought the lots next to him so nobody could build in his view. Okay? That was some very prime real estate. But he lived a long time, into his 90s. And what he used to like to do is drive down the hill, and yeah, he still drove. And he drove down the hill, and he would go to the old folks' home and after his wife had died for company, and he'd play shuffleboard and do things. He's older than most of the people in there, and he's living in his own house without any care or anything. See, good genes. And he's doing that, and he's a fairly wealthy man. And when I was 16 years old, he called my dad, said, put your kid on a plane and send him down here. And two weeks in one summer, my 16th year, I flew down there, and he took me to Hollywood, and he took me shopping on Rodeo Drive so I had better clothes. He didn't like the farm clothes I brought with me. And he took me to his attorney's office and he made me the beneficiary of his estate. And California is a community property state. And six months before he passed away and, and my dad and him passed away 20 hours apart on the same day. And my dad was in, California, or in Colorado and he was in California. So I had to make a choice whose funeral I went to. They had their funeral on the same day. So, of course, I went to my dad's. Well, here's the problem. <clears throat> Six months before he died, he's in his 90s, right? Six months before he dies, he goes down to the old folks' home, and there was a older lady that he just kind of fell in love with, and he married her. Who the hell does that at 90, right? But he married her, and she had a 40-plus-year-old son who lived in the basement of her little bitty house while she, he stuck her in the old folks' home. And this 40-year-old son didn't work. He gamed for a living. He was a gamer. Spent his life in the basement in his jammies at 40 years old in his mama's house, never had to buy a house, never had to do much of anything, and he makes enough money to live gaming. And California, the state of California, even though my, my uncle's will was written as me, the only beneficiary, they gave everything to her because it's a community property state. 
And by the time she died, she changed the estate to give everything to her 40-year-old gaming son. Yeah. That was my first fortune I lost. I didn't earn it anyway, so I could care less. But I don't like unearned money. I don't like to gamble. I don't like to do things that, where I get unearned money. All right. Where the hell was I? Okay, the other states are common law states, with the exception of Louisiana, which is a Napoleonic Code state. Okay, Louisiana is a little bit different than the rest of the country. Those French, I don't know. <clears throat> he then explained some of the technicalities of the marriage license. He said, first of all, the marriage license is a secular contract between the parties and the state. It's a contract between the parties, the husband and wife, and the state. And the state is the principal party in the contract. The state is a principal party in the contract. That's why I got married in the Bible. God is my principal party. Bonnie and I are secondary parties to God. Okay. The secular contract is a three-way contract between the state as principal and the husband and wife as the other two legs of the contract. He said in the traditional sense, a marriage is a covenant between the husband and wife and God. But in the secular contract with the state, reference to God is the dotted line and not officially considered included in the secular contract at all. Hey, you want to erase my whiteboard? <laughs> Thank you, honey. He said if the, I, I just picked on her because she's like one of the youngest in this general area, right? He said if the husband and wife wish to include God as a party in their marriage, that it is on a dotted line and they will have to add it in their own minds. The state's marriage license is strictly secular, he said. He said further that what he meant by the relationship to God being on a dotted line meant that the state regards any mention of God as irrelevant and even meaningless. In his description of the marriage license contract, he relates this by putting it on a dotted line. I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. <clears throat> He said in the traditional religious context, marriage is a covenant between the husband, wife, and God, with the husband and wife joined as one. So, I swear I have these pen stuffed somewhere, but I'm not sure where. That's a dotted line. So you know my artwork. So the state and a, a good friend of mine up in Oregon, actually he's an expert with patents, trademarks, things like that. And he actually went to the US Patent and Trademark Office and found the state marriage license patent. And with a patent, comes a blueprint. What I'm drawing is the blueprint, okay? So the state joins with the husband because he is the heir apparent. Remember that word, heir apparent. It really applies if you've got any CPS cases and all that stuff, okay? He's the heir apparent. And then N joins with the wife. And they place God on a dotted line. And any architect or engineer can tell you, is there any in this room? Okay, we're not so lucky this time. 
Oh, one, okay. Any architect or engineer, two? Well, raise your hand. Can tell you that a dotted line is a beam that bears no weight. skyrocketed because when you take God out of the picture what do you have nothing and that's how firmly I believe in this and how important it is all of you should know your marriage and if ladies if you still like him go ahead and get married in the Bible okay just annul it with the state and then get married in the Bible the right way and record it, put it on the public record. That's the way we did things in this country from 1607 to 1920. And it is legal and binding. And mine is right there in that, right there in that brown case. And it's recorded literally in three counties. It's recorded. One in Hill County, Texas, one in Johnson County, Texas, and one in Hawaii. Okay. What's that? No. I'm not worried about Hawaii at all. It may not even be there in a few months. You guys laugh, you drive me crazy. <clears throat> this is not the case in the secular realm of the state's marriage license contract. The state is the principal or dominant party. The husband and wife are merely contractually joined as business partners. That's how the state looks at it. You're contractually joined as business partners and not in any religious union. They may even be considered, he said, connected to each other by another dotted line. See, if you look at this, the same dotted line that God sits on is how the husband and wife are connected. A beam that bears no weight in the contract. <clears throat> he mentioned that this religious overtone is recognized by the state by requiring that the marriage must be solemnized either by a state official or by a minister of religion who has been deputized by the state to perform the marriage ceremony and make a return of the signed and executed marriage license back to the state. He emphasized that the marriage is strictly a secular relationship so far as the state is concerned because it is looked upon as a privileged business enterprise where various tax advantages and other political privileges have become attached to the marriage license contract that have nothing at all to do with a marriage as a religious covenant or a bond between God and man and woman. <clears throat> In civil law, the marriage is considered to be a for-profit venture or a profit-making venture, even though it may never actually produce a profit while well in its existence. 
And as the wife goes out to the local market to purchase foodstuffs and other supplies for the marriage household, she is merely replenishing the stocks of the business. In civil law, the marriage is considered to be a business venture that is a for-profit business venture, and as children come into the marriage household, the business venture is considered to have borne fruit. Now, he went on to explain that every contract must have consideration. The state offers consideration in the form of the actual license itself, that piece of paper, the certificate of marriage. The other part of the consideration by the state is the privilege to be regulated by statute. <sighs> the privilege to be regulated by statute. He added that this privilege to be regulated by statute includes all related statutes in all court cases as they are ruled on by the courts and all statutes and regulations into the future in the years following the commencement of the marriage. <clears throat> he said, in a way, the marriage contract is a dynamic or flexible, ever-changing contract as time goes along, even though the husband and wife don't realize it. A contract must be entered into knowingly, intelligently, intentionally, and with fully informed consent. Otherwise, technically, there is no contract. And this is how you annul the marriage. You use those grounds to annul the marriage. Another way to look at the marriage license contract with the state is as a contract of adhesion, a contract between two disparate and unequal parties the state is unequal to the husband and wife. Such a contract with the state is said to be a specific performance contract as to the privileges, duties, and responsibilities that are attached. Consideration on the part of the husband and wife is the fee paid and the implied agreement to be subject to the state's statutes, rules, regulations, and all court cases Relate, ruled on related to marriage law, family law, children, and property. Just because you went down and got a marriage license with the state and you joined in union, now you're subject to statute in all court cases related to marriage law, family law, children, and property. He emphasized that this contractual consideration by the bride and groom places them in a definite and defined by law position that is inferior and subject to the state. Subject to the state. Your marriage license contract helps to make you a slave to the state. Your birth certificate makes you a slave to the United States, the District of Columbia. God, my blood just boils when I read this. In regard, children born to the contract are regarded as a contract bearing fruit. And he says it's vitally important for parents to understand two doctrines that became established in the United States during the 1930s. This is how I learned about parents patrying and local parents. Started with him. Parents patre means literally the parent is the country. Or to state it more bluntly, the state is the undisclosed true parent. Along this line, a 1930s Arizona Supreme Court case states that parents have no property right in their children and have custody of their children during good behavior at the sufferance of the state. Do you understand that doctrine alone is why a CPS agent and a sheriff can walk up to your front door, kick the door in without a warrant, 
and steal your children out of your arms, out of their own beds, out of their own home, and you end up going to court to fight for them and without a warrant. That doctrine allows them to do that. Parents patry. This means that parents may raise their children and maintain custody of their children as long as they don't offend the state. But if they in some manner displease the state, the state can step in at any time and exercise its superior status and take custody and control of its children. The parents are only the conditional caretakers, thus the doctrine of in loco parentis. In loco parentis is a conditional caretaker doctrine. I need my back stretched. He said there's a few more technical details. The marriage license is an ongoing contractual relationship with the state. And technically, the marriage license is a business license allowing the husband and wife in the name of the marriage to enter into contracts with third parties and contract for mortgages and debts. They can get car loans, home mortgages, and installment debts in the name of the marriage because it's not only a privileged secular enterprise, but is looked upon by the state as a privileged business enterprise as well as a for-profit business enterprise. The marriage contract acquires property throughout its existence and over time, it is hoped that it increases in value. And this goes to legal term, limited, conditional title or lease, which is the right to make a profit or incur a loss. Same thing when you buy a car. If you don't have the MCO and you drive it off and it's going to be registered, they've sent the paperwork in the minute the salesman signs it, they send that all in, that car is never yours. You have the privilege through your certificate of title, even if you put 80,000 of your hard earned dollars down to buy one, I'm talking about a, a brand new Chevy Silverado crew cab Duramax diesel. <laughs> anyway, if you do that, the minute you drive it off the lot, it's worthless, right? Conditional title release. The right to make a profit or to incur a loss. The marriage contract by, bears fruit by adding these children, and if sometime later the marriage should fail and a divorce results, the contract continues in its existence. Oh, yeah. How many people have been married more than once? If the contract continues in existence, well, isn't that adultery when you get married the second time? We've got to start thinking about the things we do. For our lack of knowledge, we're destroyed. The divorce is merely a contractual dissolution or an amendment of the terms and conditions of the contract. Jurisdiction of the state over the marriage, over the husband and wife, now separated, continues and continues over all aspects of the marriage, over marital property, over children brought into the marriage, over spousal support, child support, visitation, education, health care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The state has a say in it forever. Because every time you deal with any of those things, you have to go through the state to deal with it. I understand that. You think they bound you? They bound you. Right? Yep. Yep. You're exactly right. You can also annul in any state for cause. Okay. 
That is why in family law and the domestic relations court calls divorce a dissolution of the marriage because a contract continues in operation but is in an amended or modified form. He, he also pointed out that the marriage license contract is one of the strongest and most binding contractual relationships that the state has upon its people. Yeah. One of the strongest, most binding re contractual relationships the state has upon its people. Just because you went down and got a marriage license. What made you do that? Because you just were taught that's the way it was done. They indoctrinated you by convincing you that that's what you have to do. You went to your priest who's running a 501c corporation as part of government and the church became government and he got deputized and solemnized as a government employee as a deputy with a promise not to follow God's word and to follow the state's word instead. And your own preacher or in your own church in whatever religion you're in who requires a marriage license in order to marry you, well, this is why Jesus Christ was against organized religion. It's a return to bondage, exactly right. God was against four professions in the Bible. Do you know what they are? Bankers, the money changers. When Jesus Christ, the most perfect and peaceful human being on the face of the planet, when he got violent is when he turned over the money changers tables in the temple and he fashioned and made the whips to whip them bloody as he beat them to the door. I want you to understand what an example that is to us. As people, we need to follow Christ. And we need to be as peaceful and as perfect as we possibly can throughout our entire life. But we, when we see something so evil as the bankers running this country into the ground, using the Bar Association as their soldiers in the Department of Justice, then maybe we ought to be fashioning whips like Jesus Christ did. Now, I know in today's world that's pretty hard because the sheriffs have guns and force and bulletproof vests, and we can't do that. We can't do that today. Jesus himself did it. The bankers, attorneys, doctors. Who are doctors? What is the root word of doctor? What is the definition? What is the meaning of doctor? Doc tender. He's the guy that tenders the vessels and pulls them out of the water. He takes their soul plate, their footprints is a soul plate. It's symbol, satanic symbolism for taking that baby's soul. When he takes the placenta and pinches the cord immediately, he just committed a violent offense 
One third of the baby's blood is in the placenta and it should drain back automatically into the baby, should be left attached for 15 to 20 minutes minimum. And a lot of babies die because it's cut off too early because they didn't have enough blood in there. If the placenta is a little bit bigger and the baby's a little bit smaller, that's why babies get jaundice. Jaundice wouldn't exist if they left the placenta attached. That's the symbolism of taking the baby's blood. They take one third of the blood on average. They take its blood, its life blood, and they take its soul, and they create a vessel, the dock tender, creates that ship, that vessel, and the mom, well, she signs off as an informant. Do you know what the word informant means? Someone who get, gives someone else up to another. Just like police have informants. They give up their higher up drug deals dealers to the police department. The informant informs on another and gives them up. When you fully understand how wrong this is and you fully comprehend it and you see how a true evil in its nature where that baby comes out of the water is tugged through the birth canal is docked at the dock by the dock tender where a bill of lading is received a bond an insurance policy and a trust is created and then the vessel the ship is sent out to sea with the tug the tugs the mom tugs it out to sea it can't walk under its own power. It's got to be tugged. Baby hasn't got his engine started yet. Okay? Understand the meaning of this stuff. And it's sent out to sea where it's presumed dead and lost at sea because we stole its blood and we stole its soul. And it's out to sea where it's presumed dead and lost at sea until it should return after its seventh year and claim its minor estate. Yeah, it actually says that. Her eighth birthday she joins the age of accountability. The way the words are written in the SESTA-QV Acts going back to 1666. You guys got that one, right? <clears throat> the way it's written is after its seventh year. So the seventh year ends, it's the eighth birthday, they can claim their minor estate. Now you have to help them until they're 18. But the legal definition of the word minor is someone under the age of 18. We all know that one. The lawyers don't mind telling us that. The teachers don't mind telling us that. You're a minor until you're 18. The government doesn't mind telling you that. But it also says, or of any age that hasn't claimed its minor estate. So I don't care if you're 99 years old, you're still a minor if you haven't claimed your minor estate. Absolutely. Look up who can an attorney represent? An entity, a business, right? Any dead entity they can represent. They can represent somebody infirmed, somebody incompetent, or a minor. Did I mention the word a ma competent man or a woman? An attorney cannot represent a competent man or a woman. So by you hiring one and contracting with one, 
You just ruled yourself incompetent. An attorney can also represent someone indigent. And this, I want to cuss so bad right now. This judge ruled Bonnie indigent. You know how much gold and silver I got in the safe? I'm not going to tell you. It's a lot. In fact, I got more than one safe. I have cash in the safe. Well, that shit's just debt notes. I don't count that. I got ammunition in the safe, and I have guns in the safe. And we have lots of real estate, and we own that real estate free and clear under land patent. That gold and silver I got in my safe is worth more money than that judge has in his entire bank account. And I'm about to prove it to him. And God willing, I'll take it away from him. And then I'll have to buy another safe. At the end of our hour-long meeting, I somewhat humorously asked if other people had come in and asked the same questions that I was asking. The assistant replied that in the many years he had worked there, he was not aware of anyone else ever asking these questions. He added, that he was very glad to see someone interested in the legal implications of the marriage license and the contractual relationships it creates with the state. His boss, the young woman marriage bureau department head, piped up and said, you have to understand that people who come in here to get a marriage license are in heat. The last thing they want to know is technical, legal, and statutory implications of the marriage license contract. I hope this is helpful information that anyone interested in getting more familiar with the contractual implications of the marriage license. The marriage license, as we know, it didn't come into existence until long after the Civil War and didn't become standard practice until the 1920s. And by the 1930s, it became firmly established. In effect, the states or governments appropriated or usurped the control of marriages in a secular form and in the process declared common law applicable to marriages abrogated. They actually did a declaration and abrogated common law marriages. You can still force it because we never gave them the power to create. And you have the unalienable right of self-determination to determine everything in your life because God gave you that gift. Now let's have a little fun. Didn't that piss you off? I, I look back at all the things that I learned, and the two things that pissed me off the most was learning about the doctrines of parents, patriot, and local parentis, what the marriage license did, and our birth in the Sustacubi Trusts, and no full and honest disclosure of any of those terms and conditions of those contracts. Let me ask you a question. When that baby was coming out of you mothers here, and you were in that room, did the doctor call in a securities license agent to explain the, the securities in the trust? Wait a minute, really? So the security, you can't sell a security without a prospectus and then a 72 hour wait before you can even sell it as a licensed broker to somebody.
That's illegal. But he did it. How about the insurance policy that went along with that? You know, that's insured. Think of it kind of like FDIC insurance. It protects the IMF, the World Bank, if you should die of SIDS 14 days later or get run over by a car at two before their investment has profited. So it's insured as well. The bond is a guaranteed bond, a security. Where was the attorney in the room that explained the trust to mom? A trust was created. It's called a Sesta QV trust. Law schools have written lots of papers on it. Where, where was that attorney in the room? Now I know having all those people in the room might have been a little embarrassing at the time. But they should at least got them all into the room after the baby was born and explained to you before you filled out the birth certificate application. So that you had full and honest disclosure of the terms and conditions. And so they should have explained something like informant to you, foundling hospital to you, birthing ward to you so that you know what they meant. How many moms in here have read the Child Act back in early 1900s? See, nobody. The Child Act is what created the foundling hospital in America. Now this happened years and years earlier in England, okay? But in America, it was created in the early 1900s. So let's have some more fun. Federal Reserve notes are not taxable income. What? Isn't all this crap you have in your wallet say Federal Reserve note right at the top? Right at the very top. What goes at the top of a page? The title. They titled it Federal Reserve Note. Title 26 of the United States Code is the Internal Revenue Code, and in sections 1271 through 1275, it deals with assessing a tax on a debt instrument. Section 1275 defines a debt instrument. And it says, the term debt instrument means a bond, debenture, note, or certificate of other evidence of indebtedness. I hold this in my hand and I'm $20 in debt. I hold a piece of silver in my hand and I'm $20 in positive, in credit. But when I hold this, I'm $20 in debt. The more of this you have, the more in debt you are. That was their plan, to make you a debtor, because when you're a debtor, you're indigent. So the judge might be telling Bonnie, we got too much cash. So 7K, here I come. I'll give you some more. Because I'm gonna prove to that son of a buck. <laughs> I'm being nice, trying not to cuss. That I probably have more money than he does, real money. Plus, he has two. Oh. All right. In 26 U.S.C. Section 1274, 3D, 
It said dead instruments, which are publicly traded or issued for publicly traded property. Don't we exchange this for in the public for property? <clears throat> it says our money is based on dead instruments that are publicly traded and issued for publicly traded property. So it appears to be excluded from taxation according to these rules. Did your employer pay you in gold and silver? Or did he pay you in debt? Well, why the hell are you paying income taxes? The definition of income and the definition of wages is two different things. Wages are money earned from the sweat of one's brow. That's the definition. That means you go work for it. Income is money earned from investments made from wages you've already earned. Now, by that definition, when you go to work for your employer and you make, I'm going to make it generous, 100000 a year, do you put it on the 1040 as income tax? You shouldn't have to. Wages and income are a different definition. Where'd the 1040 come from? <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, the country was having a little bit of a financial problem. So he invented the 1040 bond, and he stood a, and gave a speech to support the war effort. We have 1040 bonds available for your purchase, but we need you to consider it a gift as it may never be repaid, and not one was ever repaid. So now your 1040 is a gift from you to the federal government. That's why it's voluntary. So you sign a 1040 under the pains and penalties of perjury by voluntary compliance. <coughs> so you just volunteered, you just volunteered to give them a whole bunch of this crap And you signed under the penalty as a perjury that the figures were right. Now, you just committed perjury. So if you filled out a 1040 form, pay your damn tax and then quit paying. So if you filed an extension, You've already committed the perjury. You just haven't given the figures yet, but they're counting on them coming in soon. So finish it, your taxes, pay them, and then never look back. Chalk it up to one big expensive education. It is. It's already bankrupt. It's already been divided into two halves, the debit side and the credit side. And one was sent over to Bank of America to manage, and the other side was sent over to Chase. You know, I'll tell you, you can figure it out for yourself if you want, the same way I figured it out. We sent some forms to the IRS in Ogden, Utah, Attention Credit Department. And they sat there at the post office. We sent them registered mail. And they sat there at the post office, sat there at the post office, sat there at the post office. I'm wondering why they're not picking it up. And then all of a sudden, the green cards get picked up and signed in Louisville, Kentucky by J.P. Morgan acting as agent. We've sent it 
attention debit department to the same place in Ogden, Utah, Internal Revenue Service, Ogden, Utah. And we have gotten return letters back on Bank of America's letterhead. Because the IRS has been in receivership. They never were a government agency in the beginning. Who holds their corporate charter? Their corporate charter doesn't even exist. Let me find you something really quick. <clears throat> this is fun. I love you guys. Go ahead, really quick. Threat, duress, and coercion, and you gave them your consent and permission under the pains and penalties of perjury. Okay, now listen to this. Sometimes FOIA requests are pretty cool. Sometimes they're not so cool. But this is a letter on the Secretary of State of the State of Texas's letterhead with her seal on it. And I'm going to read it to you. It says, Certificate of Fact. That's what it's titled. Fact. From the Secretary of State of the State of Texas. And here's what it says. The undersigned is Secretary of State of Texas, hereby certifies that a diligent records cert, I'm sorry, a diligent search of the records of the office was performed on the name Internal Revenue Service. It is a further certified that the search revealed the following, that there is no record of a domestic corporation, professional corporation, professional association, limited partnership, limited liability partnership, or limited liability company by the name searched. That there is no record of a foreign corporation, professional corporation, professional association, limited partnership, limited liability partnership, limited liability company, business trust, real estate investment trust, or other foreign filing entity with a registration to transact business by the name searched, Internal Revenue Service. There is no record of an out-of-state financial institution registered by the name searched, Internal Revenue Service. There is no record of an assumed name certificate on filed by the name searched, Internal Revenue Service. And there is no record to indicate that a designation of agent for service of process is on file for a Texas financial institution, unincorporated nonprofit association, or even a defense-based development authority by the name searched, Internal Revenue Service. In testimony whereof, I have hereunto signed my name officially and caused to be impressed hereon the seal of the state of my office in Austin, Texas on May the 11th of 2020, Signed, Ruth R. Hughes, Secretary of State of the State of Texas, on her letterhead. The Internal Revenue Service has no license to do business anywhere in the United States of America. That's where they started. Even Puerto Rico kicked them out. Do you understand what I just said? Stop funding the cabal. All these are verifiable reasons why we beat the crap out of the IRS all the time. And if any of you got IRS problems, 
call Leland down in my office. That man used to be one of the top bankers in the world. Okay? And he went to federal prison for five years because the, the Clintons didn't like him. And they set him up on tax evasion. And they tried to kill him in prison. And we fought the IRS together, him and I, and we won. And we had all the liens removed off his property, what he had left. They took a lot of it while he was in prison. And now he's working out of our office and he's got the paperwork necessary to pretty much destroy any IRS case. As far as the IRS goes, Title 15 is the IRS's Achilles heel. Okay? Mm-hmm. Title 15 relates to verified assessments. See, the IRS doesn't even follow their own law. They'll send you out a notice, hey, here's an invoice, you owe such and such. Get it paid. And then before you know it, they file a lien on your property without any due process of law, usually. Sometimes they file that lead and you don't even find out about it until the county sends you a letter. Where was the verified assessment? The proof that you owed the debt. Where was the due process? Where was the 72 30 15 10 judgment day? Where was it? Where's the due process? What is due process? We, we never finished this question yesterday. You think I didn't remember? Where was the due process? What is due process? Due process is a right to a jury of one's peers. Due process is a right to question your adversary, your witnesses against you, to put on evidence on your behalf, to call your own witnesses. It's fundamental fairness by a true judge, not a magistrate operating in admiralty law, following statute and opine. Ah, where did I come up with that word? Opine. Opine is opinion. Case law is SMU because it is merely the opinion of a judge somewhere at some time. And whatever that man did does not apply to you and it is not the same as you. Not only that, it's just merely the judge's opinion. It's hearsay. And that judge may not have liked the way that man looked, the way he talked, the evidence he put on, the attorney he hired. They might not have liked the way that the fact that his attorney never objected. Maybe he didn't put on witnesses. Maybe he didn't have a jury of one's peers, so the judge ruled against him. Maybe the guy just missed a deadline on filing a piece of paper. And so the judge ruled against him and wrote an opinion. And they're going to use that against you later? He, he could have just been having a bad day. Maybe just had a fight with his wife. Maybe his kids pissed him off. You understand, they don't even follow the law. I'm watching Bonnie's case real closely, and they're breaking every felony in the book. I can't wait till I get my hands on them. It's my turn. I'm 
just chomping at the bit, waiting. It's driving me crazy. I'm vibrating. I'm so excited. I like this man already. There's five trading with the enemy acts. One's the original trading with the enemy act. Do you know who the enemy is? You, the people. With that act of Congress, and even before that with the Libra Code and a few executive orders before that, the government declared you the enemy. The Trading with the Enemy Act, the Buck Act, the Patriot Act, and other acts of Congress have declared you the enemy. That's your government if you're a U.S. citizen. <clears throat> How do you feel about that? Well, then vote with your feet and get off the citizenship. Take your birthright back. Be a state national. Don't care what they say. Stand up and argue. Raise your voice. That's the problem with Americans. We go sit on the couch and we're quiet. We're entertained by movies and sports. I love to fish and I gave up fishing years ago. I haven't held a pole since 2006. And I own two brand new ones. And they still got wrappers on them. See, I quit doing those things because you are more important to me than fishing. You are more important to me than fishing. Raise your voice, join in and assemble and alter, reform, or abolish. Break the chains that enslave you. I'd get hot. U.S. versus Long. A jury found Mr. Long not guilty of willful failure to file a tax return. In Donnie Williams versus Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service, the Supreme Court said a note, even when and payable on demand and fully secured is still only a promise to pay and therefore a debt. Since Federal Reserve notes are not secured and payable on demand, according to the law, they are only a promise to pay and are not payment. Wow, didn't you take a bunch of them and go give it to your utility company? You know they're not even considered payment of that debt. I'm going to try and explain that to you a little too. <clears throat> a debt is not paid by the giving of a note. No one company versus Maryland casualty. A note is only a promise to pay and not payment. Fidelity Savings Bank versus Grimes. A check payable in notes is an altered instrument and is void. MRS. 1954 C 188 section 124 and 125 section 411 of title 12 of the United States code reads as follows federal reserve notes are to be issued at the direction of the federal reserve board for the purpose of making advances to the federal reserve banks and the note shall be a, the obligation of the United States of America and if one of you guys will get on your phone Pull up 12 USC 411. I'll read you the whole thing because it's that important. 12 USC section 411.
And Norton versus Shelby County says an unconstitutional act is not law. It confers no rights, it imposes no duties, it affords no protection, it creates no office, it is in legal contemplation, it is inoperative as though it had never been passed. Thank you, honey. All right. Federal Reserve notes to be issued at the discretion of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System for the purpose of making advances to Federal Reserve banks through the Federal Reserve agents as here and after set forth and for no other purposes are authorized. They're only to be traded between banks. Doesn't say you can go buy groceries with them. <clears throat> the said note shall be obligations of the United States and shall be receivable by all national and member banks and Federal Reserve banks for taxes, customs, and other public dues and for no other purposes are authorized. They shall be redeemed in lawful money on demand at the Treasury Department of the United States in the City of Washington District of Columbia or at any Federal Reserve Bank. They shall be redeemed by lawful money. What is defined as lawful money in the United States? One ounce of silver of so many grains, right? Lawful money. There's a big difference between what's lawful and what's legal. Somebody says, is it legal to do that? I say, well, I don't care. Because legal is statutory in nature. Lawful is righteous in nature. If your family's starving to death and you don't have any money, what about going and hunting a deer in your backyard and putting it in your freezer? That's lawful. Did you have to go get a license and a tag? That's legal. What does the government say they can only regulate? Commerce. If you went and got a license and a tag, you could take that deer, cut it up, and sell it, the meat to your neighbors. And then they can regulate it and make you get a license and tag. But if you went and got the deer just to take home and feed your family, it's called subsistence hunting. And it's perfectly lawful. Because it's righteous. God did what? What did God do in Genesis? God created all things. And then he commanded me, man, to take dominion over what? The land, the air, and the water, and everything they're in, the fowl of the air, the beast of the fields. What the hell's a deer? Beast of the field. And subdue it. That means to know how to use it, not to waste it, but to know how to use it. The Indians, they used every single piece of the deer for something. They made buttons and decorations out of the bone, out of the horn. They used the sinew to sew with the tendons of the deer. They ate the meat. They used, yeah, I mean, they used every little piece. Title 12, Section 411. Thank you. Very important. But see, if you don't know this, how do you defend yourself in court? Don't call me. You know how many people call me? I can't even begin to. And one of our brothers in here, I, he changed clothes, so I can't spot him from here with 
my eyesight, but he handed me that little red book up there that I got to be given back. He wrote it the night before, and I'm not going to tell you any details. It's his personal business, but he's got seven problems in there he wants my opinion on. And you know what I did when I woke up this morning? I read the whole damn book. So that sometime today I can discuss with him what he does with his seven lawsuits. You know how many of those people there are out there? Just say lots. David can't do it all. I try, but I have to triage. If you're absolutely beat up and dying, I'll help you. If you got a ticket, well, it's not as important to me. You're on your own. Learn it for yourself. Help yourself. God helps those that help themselves, by the way. Okay, I guess I finished that. Cool. <clears throat> that was so fun. Thank you guys for letting me have fun. How many people have read the Communist Manifesto? Okay. Did you at least read the bullet points, the titles of each section? Okay. When was it written? 1848, you guys. How do I remember all this shit? I don't know. Big hard drive, sometimes a little short on RAM. <laughs> you get that, you computer people? Okay. The Communist Manifesto is the 10 satanic plagues of the United States. 10 satanic plagues of the United States. Number one is the abolition of private property. They don't want you to own anything, nothing. They don't want you to own anything. That's why they try their damnedest to take it away from you if you do. A heavy and progressive income tax. Income taxes have been illegal since the founding of this country. And they tried to make them legal with the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, which was never properly ratified. A man, an attorney named Larry B. Kraft proved that in the Supreme Court of the United States. Okay? That it was never properly ratified. Number three is the abolition of all rights of inheritance. They want to abolish all your rights of inheritance. Number four is the confiscation of property of all immigrants and people like me called rebels. Number five is the establishment of that central bank. Am I a rebel? No, I've just studied our history, I've studied law, and I've, and I've studied genealogy, and, and I've put everything together the way God wants us to. That makes me a rebel, I'll claim the title. But I've never said that, that's what I am really until today. But I'm feeling like a rebel today. I'm a little pissed off and nervy. Number six is government control of communications and transportation. Are you a vessel? Do you know the Department of Transportation is the largest agency in our federal government? Because it keeps records on all vessels and it reports to the State Department so they can keep records too. They keep records on every vehicle, every truck, tractor, trailer, commercial vehicle, private vehicle, 
that's registered, every ship, every boat, every four-wheeler that's registered, including you and your birth certificates, okay? Every airplane, I got that. Every airplane that's registered, the Department of Transportation keeps track of everything. And they help fund and control the corrections department. They want government ownership of factories and farmers, your agriculture. They regulate everything in agriculture. The Department of Agriculture, because I owned a ranch called Double J Ranch, has been sending me multiple surveys and wanting me to go online and fill them out and tell them how many bales of hay I produce, how many animals I have on how many acres. And every, they're asking so many questions now that are invasive. A stamp of rescission, send it back. And so they resent it to me four times already this year the same survey. And they sent me a little postcard with this last one that was attached. I thought it was kind of weird. It says, if you cannot write, go online. Well, if you can't write, can you type? <laughs> I thought, who the hell was the brainiac in that department that figured that one out? They want government control over all labor. The sweat of your brow. They want government farms with regional planning. Government farms with regional planning. They want to take all your farms. They've been trying for a long time and they're trying harder. They're doubling down right now. And if they couldn't do it, Bill Gates said he would. And he now is the largest farm owner. Of course, I have his death certificate signed in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba from several years ago and you can download it off Ancestry.com. So who the hell is this guy pretending to be Bill Gates? He even looks different. This is why we can't even go shoot him. Because we don't know who he is. We don't want to shoot somebody innocent who's just an actor. You <laughs> oh, you guys hurt me. <laughs> and they want all government control of education. Okay. I don't know about you, but just reading that pisses me off enough to want to take our country back. <clears throat> oh, I like this one too. Senate Report 95-989, paragraph 9. I'll read it again for you guys writing this down. Senate Report 95-989, paragraph 9, defines, or redefines, I should say, a court as the bankruptcy judge. Because all banks are in bankruptcy. Because all they've been doing is, is debt. Two banks, Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan, will probably be, except for Bank of America has got a really big account that they can't get at, but we can. <laughs> They're going to be the last three banks out there. Here's, here's one that's kind of fun. What did it do with pens? <laughs> There's two of them in this pocket. 
shut up. Don't, don't. <laughs> oh, God. I might have heard that wrong, but the way I heard it, you don't want to hear it again. <laughs> oh, God, where was I? J.P. Morgan has been investing in silver and gold for years. They got enough of it that they probably will never go bankrupt. Same with Wells Fargo. Bank of America does not have those gold and silver reserves big enough to cover their losses, so therefore they will go bankrupt unless they're saved. But Bank of America is the most important bank to the cabal in America. Now here, I just remembered, thank you. Whew, I had to get that out to bring up the ram. Here's one that bothers me a lot. I drive around sometimes, especially a lot of times in Minnesota, and I see these fifth, third banks. Oh, I was pretty good with math when I was a kid. What is fifth third? Well, if you take three thirds, that's one. And you have two thirds left. Two thirds of something is what? Nothing like advertising, you're just pure evil. <laughs> How many of you drove by that bank and figured that one out? I just drove by the sign. I went, pew, compute. <laughs> oh. This one's important and it's fun too. 63C of American jurisprudence. How many people read American jurisprudence? Good man. How about canon law? Do you read your judicial laws that the judiciary is supposed to go by? Jurisprudence is one of those. Okay. In 63C of American Jurisprudence, second 2D, public officers and employees in section 247, as expressed otherwise, the powers delegated to a public officer are held in trust for the people and are to be ex excised, exercised in behalf of the government or on behalf of all citizens who may need the intervention of the officer. I want you to go home and study those words. And once you break that paragraph down, you're going to see what it truly means now that you're starting to learn the English language for the first time in your life by watching David's straight seminars. Yep, section 247. Furthermore, the view has been expressed that all public officers within whatever branch and whatever level of government that's pretty clear, right? All of it. <laughs> and whatever be their private vocations are trustees of the people. And accordingly, labor under every disability and prohibition imposed by law upon trustees relative to the making of personal financial gain from a discharge of their trusts. This is about to apply in Bonnie's case as soon as I take it to federal court because I could just destroy them with it. I want you to understand that. 
God might have spent the last 35 years preparing me for what just happened. Because they couldn't have pissed me off any more than trying to mess with my wife. And they have never met a warrior like me. And I went to them and offered them a treatise, a treaty in peace and honor. And I offered them a hundred million dollar minimum, full faith and credit, guaranteed bond, backed by the United States government. And they decided to declare war instead, and the judge wrote an email to that effect and placed it upon the docket. I hope he knows how to fight like I know how to fight. Oh, that's just, that's just, see, there's two sides to every suit, every case. Most people only deal with one side and that's their side. They always fight on what their side is trying to do and they battle it. I don't. I immediately understand that if I'm not on the offense, then I'm not fighting the war. Most people spend their life playing defense only. And if you play, tell me one game you can play and win by playing defense only. Can you win at football? Hockey? Soccer? Chess? Pool? That's shooting pool. Not the swimming pool. Saw some of your eyes go, pool? <laughs> anyway, you crack me up. I love the entertainment. Thank you. It's good for me. Um, keeps me humble and keeps me alive. You can't win any game by playing defense only. If you don't go on the offense, you can't win. State statutes in all 50 states will tell you your only remedy in a state court is a tort claim. What does that mean? It means that you have to sue them, countersuit, or you have no remedy. They're telling you right there, they're gonna run over the top of you, beat you up and win. And you're going to get to hire an attorney and pay him cash to make you lose because he works for them. He took an oath to them. Tell me if he raised his hands and swore under oath while you was in his office to take an oath to you. Not one of those bastards do that. They just take your money and don't do anything for you. Please swear on your mother's grave right now that you will never accept or hire an attorney. Even God in the Bible, in his words, tells you it's a sin to hire one. Christ told you not to hire one. He told you not to hire a banker, an attorney, a doctor, or organized religion. Those are the four things he was against. He said one man, one preacher, giving you God's word will twist your mind and your soul. Never listen to one man. Men are fallible. We're imperfect. We make mistakes. 
You think your preacher doesn't make mistakes behind the pulpit? I went with Bonnie two Sundays when we first got married. I hadn't stepped foot in an organized religion church in 20 years because I learned this a long time ago, and I'm a very righteous person. But she dragged me over, and for the love of my wife, I went. And you know what I did the whole time I was there? I pointed every mistake out that that priest made, that preacher made. And I sat there twice, two Sundays, and I watched him twist the minds of the people in his congregation. And I saw two other things that he did besides twist minds. He talked crimes, crimes, and then he talked repentance and feel goody. So he made everybody feel like crap for all the sins you've been doing in the world. And then they, right near the end, right before they started passing the plate, he uplifted you and told you you could repent, come unto Jesus and all your sins would be forgiven and started quoting feel-goody scriptures, pulling them out of context of the Bible, out of the stories and changing the meanings by pulling them out of the stories. And he made you feel-goody. And the better you feel, the more money you put in a plate. And I watched it just as if I was watching a con man on TV, like some of these bigger preachers. Shh, we're not talking about dip. I got over that subject. <laughs> Will you stop it? I can't quit laughing. <laughs> All right. Within whatever branch or whatever level of government, whatever be their private vocations, are trustees of the people and accordingly must labor under every disability and prohibition imposed by law upon the trustees relative to the making of personal financial gain from a discharge of their trusts. They tell you in that paragraph that if you are charged with a crime, oh, this gets me. Oh, God. What is an indictment? It's a true bill. It says it right on the bottom of the indictment. Invoice. That's an indictment. If you don't bother to ask, well, how much is the bill? Let's settle this matter right now. How much is the bill? I asked that. Then they bring you up on charges. That's your second notice. 30, 15. And if you don't bother to ask, well, how much is the charges? Let's settle this matter right now. Then they ask you to bond. And if you don't say, how much is the bill? How much is that bond? Let's pay the bond. See, I presented a bond for payment and discharge. Invoice, charges, bond, 30, 15, 10. Then they hold your body as surety. while they take from your trust judgment day and it's called a penal sum for the amount they want to profit from you. One federal felony count of fraud is a $2 million penal sum. 
They take two million dollars out of your SESQV trust if they convict you and sentence you. Notice what I just said there? You, you. I didn't say Bob Smith. They don't sentence Bob Smith. He's the living man. They hold the capius, the body, the corpse, as surety for the bond, the dead entity, somebody infirm, somebody incompetent, a minor. That's who they hold. You getting it? This is the most important education you could have. Understand how you're all dead if you're a U.S. citizen. U.S. citizen is defined, defined in federal code as a dead entity. Why are you guys holding on to that if you still are? How many, and be honest, don't be afraid, I'm not going to bite you. How many U.S. citizens are still in here that have not done their paperwork? You put that down really fast. He went. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. If you drive down the road and you see a dead deer on the side of the road, how much standing does he have? None. This is why U.S. citizens never have standing in court. That alone should make you change your status. The most important thing you can do is send your affidavit of repudiation. What does the word repudiation mean? It means something that is so repugnant to you that it is an Im, immoral obligation. So you're acting immoral as your obligation to be a U.S. citizen. Does God want you immoral? Understand what I'm trying to get across here. It's a lot. Most people's minds by the third day are going. <laughs> Do that again. You'll take my picture. Neil already did. I'm on camera. It's going to be on the internet. You know how much shit I get for that? I'm telling you stuff that government doesn't want to know, and I'm putting it right out there in their face. I get excited, my voice goes up. Notice that? Okay. I can talk really deep, though, if I want to. All right. <laughs> that is, a public officer occupies a fiduciary relationship to the political entity on whose behalf he or she serves and owes a fiduciary duty to the public and number four, it has been said that the fiduciary responsibility of a public officer cannot be less than those of any private individual. That means he's got to be at or above in his fiduciary capacity. What does God say about a fiduciary? It's the highest form of law and responsibility he has bestowed upon you. To be a fiduciary is always for the benefit of another. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love your children, love your wife. On and on, we're to be in a fiduciary capacity at our best, at our highest level. 
Furthermore, it has been stated that any enterprise undertaken by the public official who tends to weaken public confidence and undermine the sense of security for individual rights is against public policy. Fraud in its elementary common law sense of deceit, and this is one of the meanings that fraud bears, and you'll find that in 483 of U.S. 372 in the statutes at large. You can also see United States versus Dial, a 1985 Seventh Circuit case. It includes a deliberate concealment of material information in a setting of fiduciary obligation. The public official is a fiduciary toward the public including in the case of a judge. The litigants who appear before him and if he deliberately conceals material information from them, he is guilty of fraud. <laughs> On three judges. I'm gonna, I'm gonna nail their asses to the wall. Did you hear that? You can also look that up in McNally versus United States, a 1987 case. How are we doing on time, Rob? Five minutes? Wow, that was quick. Not for you guys sitting in those hard chairs. One of the most important documents you can ever file on a court case, and it should go in every case, is a notice of existence of trust. Isn't that short and sweet to the point? It's one page, barely takes up the page, and then there's usually a notary page, okay? This can get recorded, the way this is set up is to get recorded by the county recorder's office to file this in your county. And then take the recorded filing once the county's put their stamp on it and just go to put it in your case. It's already been on the public record. This is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful document which gives you a lot of power if you know how to pull the trigger. It's like having a Barrett 50. Oops. On this day, that means you put in the date, I, David Lester Strait, make it known that there is a God trust for, that's where you put in your beneficiary, Bonnie Ruth Allen hyphen Strait, the beneficiary being her heir, his heir, says his or her, and God being the executor. In witness whereof, David Lester Strait as the trustee has caused its autograph below on this date in the year of our Lord, spelled out, as trustee, su acting su juris and just solely. Do you know what su juris and just solely mean? Su juris means of one's own rights. That's the highest level that you can obtain. To walk into court su juris of one's own right, just solely, means you're entering on the land jurisdiction. Just soil, just solely. Does that make sense? You were wondering for a second there, huh? And then they hit, I saw it. That was cute too, okay? And then you sign your name, get it notarized. Go get it recorded with the county and go put it in the case.
Okay. Existence of trust. Your trusts are private. They never have to be recorded. They're so private, you walk into court with one, you hold it up, and you say, Your Honor, I have the express trust in hand. And it clearly states who the executor is, who the trustee is, and who the beneficiary is, and it ain't you, and it ain't Mr. Prosecutor, and it ain't the jury. Now what did I just do? You opened your court. I opened my court. I took it out of all their hands. It's my court from this moment forward as long as I stand firm upon it. And I've expressed the trust. And he'll say, well, let me see that. <laughs> oh, no, Your Honor. No, you know better than that. Trusts are private. That's why I filed a, a notice that the trust exists, listing who the trustee is, who the executor is, and who the beneficiary is, and I record it into the public record, and then I put it on the record of this court. Did you read it? You understand how powerful that is? Now, the only law left in the courtroom is what's in that trust. Because that is the highest form of law. To be a fiduciary for the benefit of another. That is the highest form of law. Now, if he does anything from that second on, he has violated his, his fiduciary responsibility to the beneficiary. And you know who has the greatest right in America to bring a suit? A beneficiary against someone supposed to be the trustee. And now you just take that sucker into federal court and explain that with an affidavit and put that affidavit upon the public record filed into that court case and asked the judge for summary judgment and you can ask him for punishment of that crime and just let the United States Marshal show up at the judge's chambers and do their thing and they can haul his ass out in handcuffs and they can take him out and hang him at the nearest busy intersection at high noon. Understand the power in that. Once a judge, always a judge. Only if they operate according to their fiduciary capacity. Now he's just a freaking man if he didn't. And he can be hanged the same as any other man who's committed that kind of a treasonous crime. It is called capital felony treason is the crime. And the penalty is death. I sure as hell hope they're watching this. I'm trying to put on a show. Are five minutes up? Lunchtime. I'll start this later. When, when do they come back? Same time, same place? 2.30. 2.30.